Good evening. It's six o'clock. Uh, we'll have the regular school board meeting for the Granite Falls School District. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. It's too late now. The Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Before that, I'd like to make a motion. That we excuse Director Ledoux. Second. The motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, Director Butler, Director Kincaid, Director Carey, and I'm Director Beach. And <laughs> and Ava is our school board representative and Dr. Middleton. Thank you. Um, I always got to remember it. Uh, so let's start out with 2A board comments for WASDA report back and other comments. Director Butler. So, well, yeah, WASDA conference was great. I've been to several of these over the years. Um, and you're going to the law conference, learn about things that are on the horizon and need to be aware of. Um, a lot of it people are aware of just because of the news. But it's good to get the perspective of lawyers on what it could mean for us. Um, nothing really to report. It's all just a lot of uncertainty. Just be ready for what happens. Um, I enjoyed the sessions. Um, I spent a lot of time learning about um, inclusion and equity um, and uh, what that means going forward. Um, I also really enjoyed the professional support and the peer support you get from going to WASDA. Um, honestly, WASDA remind, reminded me of like what I really love about being on the school board. Um, I love representing the people of Granite Falls. I loved... Like, I mean, you see the pictures behind Ava. I love supporting the reading and, and the elementary schools. Um, I love helping the football games, working the chains. Um, especially love helping deliver all the food at the food drive, buying lunch for the coordinators on the delivery day. Um, I, I think most of my favorite moments of the, of the school board was actually delivering with students. And then I would challenge them if they sang a, um, a Christmas carol to the family who delivered to it, I'd buy them hot cocoa. So that was always fun, making kids feel, feel, feel awkward, but I'd get I'd help them spread Christmas cheer. Um, I love, I mean, I remember making hot cocoa for the band when they practice late at night in the cold. Um, I remember drop, buying a drum for the band. Uh, I helped build those eagle cars back there. I helped install the seatbelts in one of them. Um, love getting to know all the teachers. Wazza just brought all the things to my memory. Um, especially proud. It reminded me of, uh, the chance I had to leave this board for five years, um, three different times as the board chair, um, especially all the hard work we all did. Um, during COVID, um, unprecedented is the only way that you can really put it. Um, I love looking back and thinking, I wish I could have done this different or that different, but unprecedented means that you have no idea at the time. Um, and I think really what made what's was reminded me that all the change that we go through on the board is what's made me love it the most. Um, changes in my life as well, not just in the school board. Um, work and family are, are always changing, um, often require more of my time. Um, so it's kind of on that and with that in mind that I am I'm going to announce that uh, my last school board meeting as a director will be at the end of January. Um, our last meeting in January, I'll, I'll be stepping down from the school board. Um, I just, you know, with changes in family and work and, and life, I, it's, it's time. Um, it's been just shy of a decade. Um, and... Uh, I'm, I'm only okay with, with this because I know we have such a great board in place, great administrators and great teachers and a great community. I'm also okay with because a lot of the things I listed that I love, you know, that I'm able to do as a board member, I can still do. I already talked to Don and Paige about continuing helping support the reading program and, and the food drive. Good luck getting rid of me. Um, I'll still be able to do those things, but it's, it's time to, to step away from the board. Um, not, not stepping away from Granite, but just for, from the board. And I'd like this time just publicly to say thank you um, to the community who's, who's, who's voted for me, who's shown me the confidence, has given me the confidence I needed to represent them and the students and the teachers and the staff, and the administrators. It's crazy to think a quarter of my life has been spent doing this. Um, just want to say thank you. Um, I don't plan on being a lame duck. I'll be at all the meetings, doing all my stuff until the end of January. But at that time, I'll be stepping down and these fine people will have to find someone to replace me. So 
I know Dr. Middleton will probably share some, Dr. Middleton will share some details on the, that process, but if you're watching um, and you live in my district, you can look it up online. I encourage you to look at serving. Um, maybe you can be here for 10 years too. So thank you. <laughs> oh, you missed Robert. Yeah, I'm willing to explain that now since I'm leaving. <laughs> Dr. Middleton and I have a little game we play sometimes. When we're at events where there's clapping, the person who clapped last wins. So if you ever like an event, you hear like a little clap at the end, that's me winning. <laughs> Thank you, Director Kincaid. Yeah, yeah, I know. That was tough. Uh, <laughs> Uh, WASA was great. I, it was my first time going. Um, I learned a lot of really useful information. Um, and I also really enjoyed getting to know my fellow board members a little bit better and getting to spend some time outside of this room with them. Um, uh, I also got to hang out with Ava a little bit. And uh, I think we should be really proud that she's on our board because she was an outstanding, outstanding gal. Um, I... A lot of the sessions I did focused around smaller school districts. Um, even though we're not technically in that category, I wanted to kind of learn what they were going through. They're all in kind of small towns like we are. Um, and as you probably all know by now, my passion is parental involvement. So I wanted to see what they were doing to get their community and parents involved. Um, so that's kind of where I spent a lot of my time. Two things that um, I took with me <clears throat> that I'm excited about, I'm looking more into, I want to kind of get the fly in everybody's ear to think about it. Um, I learned about outdoor school. So um, back in March of this year, uh, legislature passed House Bill 2078, which is um, recognizing the need for outdoor school um, and bringing that into our school. So they pretty much offer it for fifth grade and sixth grade. Um, and it's free. So, you know, I'm a cheapskate, so I love anything that's free, but uh, OSB pays for all of it. And it is a great opportunity for kids to get outside and do some learning there. Um, what, a quote that they have um, in the house bill that I just wanted to read was, uh, they find that uh, time outdoors helps children thrive physically, emotionally, and academically. Yet over the past few generations, childhood has moved more indoors. On average, today's kids spend up to 44 hours per week in front of a screen and less than 10 minutes a day doing activities outdoors. Um, so that's just something I'm really excited about. And hopefully we can get going here as an outdoor school program, either in fifth or sixth grade. Um, I know when I was in fifth grade at my school, we did outdoor school. I went to a very tiny school, but it was an awesome opportunity where we all kind of bonded and it was a way that we could be kind of outside of school, but doing different things. That's where I learned how to use a compass for the first time and do all that sort of thing. I felt, and if I look back in all the times of my schooling, when we had opportunities like that, gave the students a chance to get to know each other, bullying was a lot less because we've got to actually spend time together and see each other in different ways. Um, so I'm a big advocate for that. The second thing um, that I was introduced to by a ton of different board members from different school districts um, is a program that they use for parent communication called Parent Square. And um, it's kind of everything that we have kind of all rolled into one. So it's kind of like Skyward and Remind and all these things rolled into one um, where you can consolidate all these communications um, to parents in one place, such as transportation alerts, sports teams alerts, even classroom communication newsletters. Um, information can be sent out. You can type up one thing and it will go out over at the app, text, emails, voice, et cetera. Um, things like absences, permissions, of forms, payments, all those kinds of things can go through it. But the coolest part of it is that when parents have the app, they can go in and they can select from over a hundred different languages. Um, and whatever we put out automatically gets translated into their language. It's a really cool thing, um, especially for those ELL parents. Um, so that's something I, I, I was in the middle of a meeting and someone messaged or told me about it. And I emailed Karen right away. I was like, Karen, we got to look into this. It's awesome. So anyway, so that's just a couple of things I took away from Austin. and I really had a good time. So, Director Perry. 
Yeah. Um, thank you for not, uh, <laughs> sorry, Carly, and thank you for not calling me directly after Director <laughs> Butler. Um, I, I uh, Waster was great, but I guess I, I just wanted to say a couple of things from my heart uh, about Director Butler. And I'm not going to look at him because uh, I'll start crying and never get through this. So um, it has been my honor to serve with him for the, the past 10 years. Um, uh, in 10 years, Director Butler has uh, gained a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, um, had, I think it was three kids. I lost um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually. Run, run a marathon for, was it for? Ran a marathon, ran a 5K with me. I'm certainly not at a marathon level. Um, and uh, has led the district led the district through one of the greatest challenges public education has ever had, which is through the, the COVID shutdown and, and all of that. And um, through all of that has done it uh, dutifully, um, determined uh, to uh, be the absolute best representative that he can be. Um, uh, it's funny, earlier we, we were laughing about um, my... Uh, my, my, my humility or, or potentially my lack thereof, um, uh, a lot, honestly, of what you guys see of, of the crowd today is, is kind of a false bravado. Uh, it's people like, like Director Butler that I want to be like, that I strive to be like, um, that, in, that uh, are an inspiration to me personally to work harder or try to do a little bit more um, or, you know, stay connected. Um, I'm I'm personally a, a man of faith, and uh, on stuff like this, um, I always try to turn uh, to the Lord. And, and a scripture came to my mind just as you were talking, which is Second um, Timothy four. Um, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. And uh, I don't think there's a better representative of that uh, than you, Director Butler. And uh, uh, I appreciate you uh, in so many ways, but most of all. Uh, I appreciate your dedication um, to the, the community and then the students that we serve. And uh, the people of, of District Number 2 have been extremely well representative and, and you, in the last 10 years, and your shoes are going to be impossible to fill. So I just wanted to, to make sure I told you thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, the WASDA stuff, there, there is a ton <laughs> to talk about about WASDA and what a weird transition. But uh, um, so I, I'll separate my comments maybe into two different board comments. because I, I certainly don't want to talk for 20 minutes. And I know you guys don't want to hear me talk for 20 minutes. Um, one of the, 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 the two things that I think uh, were of the most value to me that I got from WASDA is uh, um, a, uh, a free conference that I was able to attend um, that uh, was about belonging. And one of the themes of the, of the conference was how a lot of districts, um, and I would put us in that category, put belonging ahead of achievement. Um, and that belonging has to and must always come before achievement. And the need for us um, to kind of focus on that belonging piece just as just as fervently as we focus on the academic piece, because you're you're never going to get there. There's steps. You're never going to get to true academic success unless you have a, an air of belonging. So, I will certainly raise my hand as someone um, who uh, wasn't focusing as much on belonging as uh, as I should, and that's certainly something that uh, I plan to rectify. Um, the other thing, the other big piece that I got from Wasta. Again, with talking with colleagues around and, and going to the meetings and, and actually honestly getting the uh, ability to talk to uh, some of the winners of boards of distinction and stuff like that, you know, from um, medium, small school districts and um, up to the large and kind of talking to them about best practices and things that they do. And there was a kind of a theme through all of them um, that I wrote down a couple of times as I was taking notes, which is data, um, that the need for a board to uh, really lean into data and to make sure that data, uh, student success, as well as, of course, belonging, uh, is leading the decisions that you're making, um, that you are uh, leaning into that data, focusing on that data, and letting the data dictate um, the decisions that you make. Um, 
is one of the things Dr. Milliton and, and um, um, Board Chair Veach and I had a, had a great meeting with a, a, a local school psych, and that was kind of one of the things that even that he said. So it was, it was fortuitous that in the beginning of WASDA and all through WASDA, um, we kind of hit that. And you know, and when, to be honest, right, we don't we aren't a a large district that is flush with cash, right? So. I think you know making decisions based upon what the data tells us that we need to do, uh, focusing on student achievement as well as belonging. I'll make sure I continue to say that is really our only um, is our only exit ramp to getting to where I, where we all feel that we need to go as far as that belonging and that achievement piece goes. Um, you know, making sure that we have people in the right places. Um, that making sure that money is being spent in the right places. Again, you know, looking at that data and letting the data push the decisions that we make. Um, I, I was reading kind of one of the pamphlets and um, uh, that they handed out in one of the breakout sessions I got. And you know, the uh, if you if you look at the majority of high performing districts, they have a boards that are very well focused on that data piece and. I, I certainly want to do that. I even bought myself this cup that I take everywhere that says, nice story, now show me the data. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to bring that to every board meeting uh, to remind myself that we need to be focusing on that data piece. Um, I've got more to say about that. We're, we're going to have a, a discussion on um, data and, and, and school reports later on in the meeting. So I, I guess I won't belabor the point. Um, and discuss it there, but um, I, uh, I I'm passionate about this this district. I'm passionate about you know our outcomes, our desired outcomes, and where we think we can go. And I, I want to be as um, data focused as as I possibly can um, to the to the point of where, uh, and this is something that we can talk later. But I just want to throw that out that um, you know. We are a new board with Director Ledoux who's not here today. Obviously, we're going to have another director here sometime in, in February um, that maybe we even need to look at our strategic plan and maybe not necessarily redo the whole plan, but modify some of our um, uh, some of our key points of the strategic plan. And I would highly contend that, um, that you know, review of data, understanding of data, data leading our decisions, belonging, you know, that those pieces become uh, integral uh, to that. So obviously that's something that we can talk more down the road, but uh, um, that, that's kind of where I'm at. So. Thank you. Yeah. WASDA was a really cool opportunity for me because I got to connect with my board more and I got to network with other school district representatives who um, see what they do different at their school and how they make it better and how I can make our, help make our school better. Um, and so that was really cool. I got to meet a lot of new people. Um, but about our high school, um, what's going on. Um, today, we hosted a new event called Freshmas, and we served a wonderful meal prepared by our culinary class and led some fun games to make our freshmen feel more welcome at our school. And um, our winter sports just started up and our girls basketball team won their last game and there's a game going on as we speak. So good luck to them. And our food drive is still going on and our coordinators have been hard at work collecting donations like money or food, like peanut butter and all kinds of stuff. So if you are able to help and bring a donation in, that would be really awesome to um, help our families in need. And how how do people make either cash donations or food donations that maybe don't have a student at the school? Um, you know, I think you go into Portia. Yeah. Ah, drop it off at the school. Yep. There you go. So you can just drop it off at the school. And I know there is a link. I'll put it back out there again. The the uh one of the classes, I guess I don't know which one made a really nice video for the food drive and the with everyone in the community holding signs and stuff. And yeah, and at the bottom there's a link, but I can't remember what it is. But I'll see if I can find it during this meeting so that I can say it because I know I have it. Any other 
So I want to, I'm going to be a little bit selfish and say thank you to Director Butler, my friend Robert. Um, I many times have looked at you and wondered how you do it, right? I mean, seven kids, you own a business, you were the school board president year after year because when it was my year, I had, you know, spinal cord surgery and you stepped up and you did it again, right? For another, for a second year. And um, it's a lot. This is not, I mean, you don't get any more. There's no prestige or more money or whatever to, to sit in this other chair, right? It's just more work. And, and I, and it's been 10 years and it was four and a half years ago that my chair was right up there in front of five board members, you know, as I sat there interviewing and hoping. Four. What? Four, four board members. Oh, what's, was Tom there? No, because he resigned. Oh, he was just sitting in the chair? No. Oh, he wasn't here. Maybe I miscounted he here. anyway. Why was he there? He was, I thought he was sitting there. He was sitting there. I don't think. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it, it seemed like there was five of them. That's not what it was supposed to be, but okay. Never but, mind. But, me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, and I mean, you've, you've been a mentor to me just even as I try to figure this out right but then also just personally supporting me my family my husband my children as you mentioned you're at the elementary school supporting reading you're at the high school supporting football and and parking lot chili cook-offs and and all things Granite Falls and we will miss you on this board, but I have no doubt we will see you everywhere because that's just kind of who you are. So I appreciate your time and service, but um, I don't think you're going far. No. <laughs> you just might. Right. <laughs> yeah, you'll be right here. So my report from WASDA, I kind of skipped around. I don't think I, I picked a real thread when I was there. I was sort of just touching things that were interesting. And interestingly, there must have been several presentations on data, but I enjoyed the law conference and several of the um, kind of the presentations from the attorneys and from, you know, um, different representatives about what sort of is coming from the Supreme Court all the way down that we could be looking for to somehow land in our district maybe in the next year or two. So that was kind of interesting. I don't really have any highlights from that. I took a lot of notes, but it's mostly about Supreme Court cases, and I'm not sure this audience cares. So, <laughs> well, if I'm being super honest, they haven't made a decision yet. I so, said the same thing. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the, I went. I, I attended a session about, and I can't remember the exact name of this of the session, but it had to do with district improvement plans, and it had to do with um, high achieving districts and the correlation with their school boards, you know, and and I'm listening, right? I've, I've seen the reports that the schools are bringing to us. I've seen the data that, that we've had thus far. I've seen the data from the state, from iReady. Um, and so I, I thought I have to show up to this particular session, right? What is a board doing in a district that's, that's really high performing and what can we do differently? Right, some of those things um, that really, I mean, kind of the takeaway, I'll, I'll cut right to the chase, was that there's a strong correlation between school districts that perform well and school board meetings that where the board spends 50% or more of the time discussing the data. So it's less PowerPoint slides of, of you know, cute activities and, and wonderful things and more about driving toward the data and the data that supports what we're doing, where, we're, what framework we're aligned to, how we're going to get there and what we're doing in the day to day. It's not, it's not once a year presentation, right? It's every board meeting, every time making progress 1% at a time, 1% and readjusting. And they, were, they showed, and Dr. Middleton sat near me in that presentation, and, and they showed, you know, study, I mean, these were peer-reviewed studies, this just wasn't anecdotal data, this was, these were peer-reviewed studies of time and again, when you're focusing on the data, when you're making those adjustments, 
when the board is looking at that and, and discussing policies and discussing financing, the, the things that are needed to get you there, right? When you're telling us what it is you need, because in fact, I'm going to read this because I wrote it down. I thought it was important just for my own self. And I, I guess this is, this is what I want to say to all the presenters from now, from this WASDA forward, right? We want to ensure that we're having an honest, data-focused conversation at this meeting and future meetings and where we are today and trends over time and where we want to be and what are interventions and strategies that we try and what works and what doesn't, right? And how are we going to get from where we are to where we want to be? Like, and we have to, and I wrote this, like we have to have an honest conversation about blockers and things that you need to facilitate progress. Like, whether it's tools or support, training, policy updates, I mean, maybe there's a, there's a policy that we're just not aware that makes your job so difficult, you know, because you're navigating around something we don't realize is making everything super difficult or whatever. So maybe it's a policy update or procedure or something, but don't be shy. We need to improve. I can't look at those scores and think, well, I sure hope somebody else takes care of that. Right, it's us, and we're up here, and we're doing our best, but we need to have that communication, and and for us, that's the data, right? We need to be able to see it so that we can see how we can best support you. Admittedly, we are on very tight funding; nobody's arguing that. So we really have to be very strategic in how we're spending those funds. And I want to spend those funds to support our students. That's my. That's my, that's why I sit in this chair. So anyway, that was, I, I think it's very important for us to have the right people in the right places to, to get the success, right? And I support whatever we need to do to do that. And um, yeah, so I guess I don't have the mug yet or the glass yet, but, get you but, but yeah, if you could pick in that link, that'd be good. Anyway, so I, I just want to let you know that those things are very important. And, and I heard the message that the data was telling us. For you to be more successful, we need to see that in this meeting and have those conversations. So thank you. All right. And now we are on to district reports. 3A, Dr. Middleton. Victoria Corey, uh, just let me see if I click on this. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to unplug and unplug it, I think. All right, try clicking this again. Put me. Try clicking it again for me. There we Thank go. you. Yep, you're welcome. So, first, I, I just want to share that uh, thank goodness for WASDA. Uh, I. I was running on fumes, I think, and um, to go and really get reinvigorated by why we're here, and that's for student learning. It was really at the right time, and uh, was, like I said, it's just reinvigorated my, my passion for uh, moving our district forward, working with you, working with our admin team, and I want to thank our admin team for being here tonight. We're, we are talking at sort of a high level today on uh, those school improvement plans, they'll spend a lot of time when we get to their buildings on the specific things, but I appreciate them coming tonight just to, to hear what you had to say about WASDA, to, for you to see and um, ask the command myself or the principals on some of those things. But um, anyways, the, it, was, it came at the right time. So um, a couple of my, my takeaways was um, Director Carey and uh, uh, Director Beach and I had dinner one night with a professor from Gonzaga, and he's been looking at our data at sort of a 30,000 foot level, and he, he sort of nailed a couple of key points, but I think one of the things that he said right away was, you know, if you really want to 
turn this around, the long-term investment is doing some literacy uh, intervention for your three and five-year-olds. Well, we look at the strategic plan right behind you, and number three is early learning. So we've made that commitment already. Now we need to do some action, and I'm not sure what that looks like, but it's not going to be a high dollar amount, but it is getting our district involved with young parents of two, three, four, five-year-olds and really pushing literacy. That's what's going to make some early investments so that when they get to kindergarten, as, um, as you know, Don and Patty would share with you, is that that gap is so wide. You have those who are already reading to those who have, haven't been read to. And so uh, that's that's a key thing in a way. The second um, was we had that presentation by the student panel uh, from different districts. And they spent about an hour talking to this room of 2,000 or 1,000 directors and how important it is to have on, on your board, students. And so Ava, thank you for stepping up this year. Thank you for going to WASDA and participating. And we really do want to hear your voice and we'll continue to ask um, Greg and I can visit and see if there might be a crossroads rep. We had one for a little while, but maybe we can get one up here again. And then the, um, the session that Director Beach mentioned, was for board of directors and it was what you do does matter. Um, and so they spent some time talking about those characteristics of low performing districts and high performing uh, districts and, and you know have that relationship with, with boards and how it's measured with the um, highly functioning boards and successful boards is that self-reflection tool that we took in the fall or that you took in the fall. And so I think we could do two things in January before Director Butler you know, uh, <laughs> do something in January, February, a work session where one, we, we do talk about the strategic plan again and making some modifications and drilling down a little bit on goal number two. Yes, it's important to have powerful teaching and learning, but how is that measured? What are the outcomes we're looking for? And then second, we do need to go through that, uh, that assessment that, that all of you took. So just some of those takeaways. But going back to um, that improvement, the, the takeaway from the session that we were at was number one, goals are fine. You know, great, let's set these goals that we're going to have. But if you're not doing something different, it doesn't really matter. The, the, the results are going to be the same. And that something is what those interventions are and those changes that, or processes that you put in place. So it, it goes back to that, you know, results have little to do with goals. It has to do with what you're doing differently. What are you doing with your systems and processes? And so there are a couple of good graphs that, that come out of this. So this, this upward straight line, yeah, that's what we want to see happen. Over time, our results get better. And if we're doing something, the reality is it's probably going to take a dip first and then go up. Because what's, what's in this green, let me go back. What's in that green area between the two lines, it's called the Valley of Disappointment. But that's where all that work is. That's where the PLC work is. That's where we're reminding our, um, our instructors, okay, what is the standard that we're focused on? It's using our academic learning time. It's all of that. And then over time, all of a sudden, it just it takes off. So we have to be realistic in our expectations. It's not going to be a, you know, straight up. But we're going to do that work. And Dr. Manz is going to spend a few minutes talking about what that work is. And then that's what, what happens. But here's my concern is we could add another line. And if we don't do anything, the results are going to stay down here. So same old thing. 
we get the same old results. So I, I think we are all saying the same thing tonight. We've got to be looking at our data. We've got to be saying, okay, if we're low in this area, what are we going to be doing differently in the future going forward? Well, and as I said, Dr. Manz is going to spend a bit of time on that. Okay. Um, before shifting gear, well, I'll shift gears and talk about a couple of other other items here. I want to talk about food drive for just a minute. Um, Mr. Dimity and uh, Ms. Sullivan reached out to the office today, and they wanted to ex extend an invitation to the board uh, for deliveries, and those are occurring on December 14th and 15th between 8 and 4.30 p.m. So if you would like to be involved in deliveries, um, just you can reach out to me or Melanie or directly to um, Eric or Trudy. Uh, you're also invited um, if you want to participate in the shopping experience, which is Saturday at the Marysville Fred Meyer from 8 to 12. So that's when they go and spend tens of thousands of dollars uh, from donations getting the food for the deliveries. And then the last part, which is no surprise, because I know a lot of charitable organizations are experiencing a bit of a um, cash crunch this year with inflation and things being so tight. They're a little bit shorter this year. They're about five to $6,000 short in cash donations compared to other years. And they also have a, a higher need for food. So um, Ava had, had mentioned earlier the, the opportunity for donations in either uh, uh, monetary or in food. So I uh, want to keep that in mind for the board as well as for those who are watching. And again, feel free to email either Eric or Trudy if you uh, want to participate or have questions. Of course, you can contact me or Melanie as well. Um, so with a, a board resignation, just really quickly, once uh, that intention, once uh, Director Butler writes something to us, uh, then at that that meeting um, after we get that, that piece of paper, it's formally accepted. And that's when the time that the clock starts. So 90 days from that point on. And in our board policy and procedure, we post those openings. We, we send out what the expectations are for, uh, for board of directors. Uh, we ask for a letter of interest describing that person's qualifications and desire and reason for wanting to serve. Um, it comes down to um, interviews with multiple candidates. We would uh, have, have those interviews in open session, and then that new board member gets sworn in. And so uh, it's just really be mindful of that clock, because if we don't pick someone within those 90 days, then the uh, Northwest Educational Service District does that for us. I'll just say, uh, you know, Director Butler, I'll have more to, to share maybe at your, your last meeting, but, um, you know, Director Butler has been uh, just a, a wonderful member of the Board of Directors. Um, having worked in a number of districts, it's, uh, it's, it's so important to have an important board that you work with closely. Um, you know, I serve as the agent of the board, yet, you know, it's, it really is, uh, you know, the six of us as we, we uh, help lead this, this, uh, this district. Um, when I think of, uh, of Robert Butler, though, the words that come to mind are servant leader. Um, his picture could be in the dictionary because he is truly a servant leader and I've just appreciated him, and I've appreciated his his friendship even more. And I know uh, might be leaving the uh, might be leaving the board, but uh, you know the friendship goes on forever. And he's gotten a few days on me, calling me dad a couple times, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we still uh, just appreciate the person that he is. Um, Final thing I'll, I'll say about uh, Director Butler is, uh, as you know, last week I was uh, I was pretty sick, um, and of course we had a lot of snow, and 
we have a great early morning snow crew that goes out and I go out and drive and Monday and Tuesday I went out and drove and I'm struggling on Tuesday morning, but get out there. Uh, Tuesday night, I called Robert because he always says, hey, if you need someone to drive, I'm always up at that time. I'd be happy to. And it was without a second thought. He said, of course I will. Yes, I'll, I, I can do that for you. And I just appreciated that. And I feel like that was one thing off my mind and allowed my myself to feel a little bit better. So that's just one example of that servant leadership that, uh, that he brings. There's so many more. And uh, I know, Director Butler, that one of our key roles, uh, the takeaway of early learning literacy, I see that could be a, a big role that we could partner with you as a, as a citizen. So thank you for all that you've done. Questions or comments? Um, safety, anything on safety? Uh, as per um, you know, I don't, we did have our, our monthly meeting with uh, the city today and um, uh, I did have a chance to visit with uh, uh, our, our chief and we, we have some things that we want to look at specifically at the, at the middle school, uh, especially when you have an, within, uh, within the campus in a, uh, an outbuilding that has doors, but your perimeter is secure. So we are working on some things there. Um, and uh, we've also have tasked uh, uh, Dion to be looking for some, some different type of escape gates because right now with the secure perimeter um you know if something were to happen you know kids are going out but it would take someone to unlock one of the rolling um, gates and roll that away and then then get out there are gates similar to the ones at the stadium that we want to install uh, specifically at the middle school so that you know if we need to go out for some uh, you know for some reason they could just push right out. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Middleton? I just have a comment. I found the website for the food drive. It is GFSD, Granite Falls School District, fooddrive.com. Oh, that is where you go to uh, make donations or find out more information. I knew I had it. All right. Item 3B, the non-discrimination and affirmative action procedure 5010 update, prepared by Jennifer Harmon. Good evening. I didn't have a presentation um, for this procedure update, um, but uh, if you had any questions, I can certainly answer any questions that I can answer that. I will make, uh, will point out that the procedure um, had goals that were set for 2015. So it does need to be re-looked at as a um, board, as a district, and really want to you know, the goals that are in that procedure. So do you have, so to discuss the procedure, so you did not update the procedure? No, I did, with current data, ah. um, current um, breakdown of staff by um, race, by sex. Okay. Our student numbers. So all the data that's in there is current data as of November 2023. Okay. Uh, or do you have questions? I, I have a couple of, I don't want to jump in front of anyone else, um, but I, I guess I can go. Um, so other than um, the changes, everything else basically is remaining the same. Right, Every, uh, the language, the all the other stuff. Um, Dr. M, just out of curiosity, who it says, um, who is our compliance officer? Is that Jennifer, um, your designee? Um, it's, it says uh, has given the compliance officer the direct responsibility to ensure the Grand Falls School District is in compliance with affirmative actions, and thus delegates him or her the responsibility of selecting and appointing an affirmative action committee, existing a, a compliance officer. So we use compliance officer a couple of times in that, but I think they're separate people. And, and the reason why I say that it says the has given the 
Superintendent's designee is appointed as a compliance officer. So who's your, who's your designee? That's uh, that's Beth. Beth wears a lot of different hats. Okay. Um, when it comes to Title IX compliance, OCR, etc. So then it says that um, that that compliance officer in assuring is going to appoint an affirmative action committee consisting of a compliance officer. So is that the same compliance officer, or is that a different compliance officer? I have some more points. Yeah, I, I, I think it all sort of rests with uh, with Beth. Okay. And, then, uh, and and I actually thought that's might what you would say. So there, the the only change I thought is maybe we say Beth's name and you know a compliance officer in district, you know, or a title or something along those lines, and then say everything else, and Beth can you know decide who that is, just to maybe make it ease of kind of understanding. As well as you know, potentially a parent wanting to contact someone or, or something along those lines. At least they know directly who to go to. Um, I know this is a final, um, but I, I thought that maybe that was something that we could throw in there. And I know we look at this often. Sorry for never quite processing that. We can certainly move it up. I know under resources we do have district contact us. That uh, knows it's like probably the second to the last pitch. Okay. But we could designate that earlier and more clearly. And being procedure, it's, it's yeah, that's for us to to clean up. And correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm reading it wrong because I'm seeing those as potentially two people, separate people, or potentially the same person, right? Where she because it could if if it's the same person, if it's compliance officer, it has to be both of those. And maybe it's okay the way it is, but it seems a little convoluted in the way that's written. Just be reading it. Do you have any other comments? I know. Okay. So, um, I, obviously, I picked up on the fact that it said our goal was from 2015, and I noticed that it was titled final. So, I hesitate to accept it as a final tonight if our goals are marked as 2015. That was just my, I'm sorry, I did not edit this when I saved it. That was just in my folders so that I knew that was the one I was working on to send to Melanie. So, that wouldn't be final for you as the board. Okay. It's just was my thing. Well, We're tracking it in my folders. To clarify, this is a procedure, right? Right. So we don't have any action on it, do we? I hope not. Um, yeah. So under 4A, let me go back to it because now I have still have the wrong glasses like I do most board meetings. Um, for, right. Or sorry, A4. So it says a representative from the community and is responsible for the following, but I feel like there should be a space right there that makes a big difference, that it's not just the community member that's responsible for all those things underneath, but it's the, it's the set of all those representatives that is responsible for that thing, right? So I, though it's only one enter on A4, um, I think it it changes the meaning. Anyway, other than that, I have a couple of things. And then I don't know how to ask this question, but there's certain call outs of certain um, disability information and the numbers are very, very low in there. And I'm curious if we're supposed to, are we okay to publish that data when the number is one? Because it's medical information. I don't know. That's my question to you. Are we? We don't share um, with anyone who has a disability who might have a 504 as an employee. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's pretty specific. I bet I could figure it out within three questions. So it just made me nervous that we would publish the number one in relationship to anybody or any any person and their medical. Whatever. I just want to be real careful about what our responsibility to protect that kind of information is so that, it, I mean, you're not putting their name out there, but you're giving a categorization and a number, right, and some additional information that could inadvertently reveal. How about if we yeah, yeah. get a hold of Abigail from Boston? Yeah, I don't know the answer, but I just want to be sure, because if we shouldn't be publishing it, let's, let's yeah. not. If we're okay to publish it, then... But I appreciate you asking the question. Okay. 
I, I got just one other thing, because I, I guess until Director Butler said that, I didn't realize that this was a procedure, not a policy, um, because the title of the of the item was Board Policy 5010, but I, I should have seen the P. So um, I didn't realize that this, this was that. So I guess, Dr. M, it was the intent just to make us aware, because, you know, obviously, Director Butler is right. We don't we don't review procedure. We do we do policy. So is the intent just for us to be in the know? Is that why it's on the? That's, that's correct. OK. So there's no action that we need to make as far as just understanding, voicing our recommended changes and then it's really up to you and the admin team to to do that yeah. then okay i just want to be clear thank I, you for I do appreciate bringing that to my attention we had talked about a meeting or two ago that do all the policies yeah. but we never see the procedures so we talked yeah. about yeah. Just... oh yeah no, 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 i just want to make sure because it's not like and we i don't need, we just suggest and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Vote or anything. And I do um, appreciate you bringing this to us, especially because we just attended this big conference and and the title of the conference was belonging, right? So a uh, procedure that points to data of this quality um, is important for us to know and, and keep at the front of our mind. We just went and listened to the, listened to the experts. So it's good to know. Thank you. Any other questions, board? Ava, do you have any Thank you. All right. Oh, I've clicked off my agenda. Uh -huh. Oh, the staffing. You're next too for, or no? Pretty soon. Um, prepared by De Beth Mills, the Student Services Follow Up and Staffing Report. Are you on this one too? Yes. Yeah, okay. So Beth and I did together. Um, first slide. So when we talked about um, the last meeting, um, you know, there's some concern over how some of our classified numbers were increasing significantly. So we took some data from 2015 through to present, 21, 22 school year, um, with um, our enrollment data, which is in the blue, um, our certificated FTE and our classified FTE. Um, and as you can see, um, we're trending up in enrollment and, and classified and certificated staffing is following that, which would be a natural progression. Um, I know some areas are larger, which will less than I go, go into some of the paras, but just kind of, I guess it's reassuring and not because it costs more money, but um, just kind of a visual to show that we're moving in kind of the same direction. Okay. <clears throat> And some clarification about the uh, procedure being presented today, that's also part of our ensuring educational equity. Um, the procedure is in the, it's in the zeros um, that we're gonna like on a regular basis present the information. And so, is it? Yeah. Okay, I appreciate this one. All right. So in October, I presented to the school board um, some data about uh, special education. And um, some of the questions that I got were, hey, um, can we please take a look at some of the surrounding school districts so we can see how our data com compares? And um, so what I have here is um, some data from some of the Smaller-ish, the homish districts, and then um, we also pulled in Meridian, which is in Whatcom County, but they're similar in size and demographics to us. So, um, we had a nice selection here of districts to look at. Um, you'll recall that we looked at the October one um, special ed numbers, and um, I'm just going to point out a few things. I'm sure there's going to be questions about this data. One of the things about analyzing data is that it often then makes us ask even more questions, right? So um, I'm sure there will be questions, some that I may not be able to answer tonight, and I may need to do a deeper dive into this data if that's the way the questions go. Um, 
So you can see um, the special education percentage. Um, interesting to note is that only one of the districts on this list is under the 13.5% cap. Um, so, um, so most of these districts are probably submitting for community impact safety net because they're not getting funding. Um, as you recall, that over 13.5%, we don't get the special ed funding for those funding for those students. Um, other things to note are um, it seems that most of the districts, and sometimes it's hard because the numbers aren't all exact, um, seem to be operating with much fewer. Um, Paris than we are. The one that I would say is an exception to that is Meridian. And my wondering is look at their LRE data. So their 80 to 100 percent percentage is 68 percent. And my wondering is they, they have a, a comparable um, proportion of paraeducators. So they have 211 special ed students. 27 paras, we have 420 and 50. But, but the LRE is quite significantly different. So are they using those paras to support those students in the general education setting is a wondering that I have. So, um, so that's that. And then um, Director Beach had specifically asked me about um, my plan moving forward. And I do have some documents that I've created um, that I can share with you if, if you'd like, but I just did some of the bullet points um, of the plan to address that because it does seem to be something we need to look at. Um, we've already had, I've already had one focus group and some of the other ones are being scheduled um, um, talking to both certificate and certificated and classified special education staff to look at this data. And already we've um, we've had some interesting responses in terms of some folks thinking of some possible reasons for our data and um, just some interesting dynamics um, that, uh, that they were expressing. Um, so um, then I wanna talk to the staff while I'm working on, on the plan to get their input. Um, to help us guide guide the plan. But um, I have been putting together some case manager guidance uh, materials around um, making staffing requests um, and creating a process because really we haven't had a formalized process. And so something that is in writing so that people know this is the process that you need to go through when you're making that request. And so we'll then, um, train the case managers on that process. And then part of that will be um, the independence plans will need to be a part of um, that process. So not our classroom parents, but when we do assign an adult to a student, um, we have some students that we know are gonna have someone with them for life. They've got some significant medical issues, but if it's for a behavior issue, for example, or a student's not able to be independent, that right from the get-go that we need to be working on what that independence plan or fitty plan is. And then um, finally, we have a presenter, and I mentioned this in October, um, who did present to um, staff at one of our buildings last year. And um, he's very dynamic and has lots of great ideas and resources to promote independence. So we're gonna bring him back and have him hopefully be able to talk to um, all of our um, classified and certificated special education staff. So I'm gonna take notes on any questions that you have. Who wants to go first? I have both mine and Director Ledoux, but he sent the his stuff ahead of time. Why don't so. you go ahead first? Maybe okay. some of yours are similar. Okay, sure. Um, so I know that Director Ledoux said that he sent it and I think it, it got there a little after, but he had some questions. He did some analysis, but the deck from October 19th isn't up there, which, so I guess he did some analysis. If we'll go back to the numbers that you had for the SPED numbers. Um, yeah, so he was kind of looking at, I'm gonna take my glasses off and just sit closer so I can finally see it. 
All right. So he was looking at those numbers and he sort of calculated the averages and the state of the our deviations for our district. Um, and he said the ratios show that granite sped teachers are able to handle one tenth more of a student than the average of other districts. And our paras are handling 2.55 fewer children than the other districts average, plural districts, plural averages. And um, 6.4 children less when compared to Sultan. Um, and he's he just said that the 2.55 fewer, so two and a half students per ser service per para caught his attention um, because he was saying if our district, and, and I did not check his numbers, I'm just making his comments. He's, he asked if our district was even at the average of the others, then we would have 38 or 39 paras. So we just asked for some more clarity around, around kind of those numbers, right? The, the averages of two and a half students less per para average um, and maybe roughly 11 or 12 paras more than any of the others that he was saying. So then uh, he said, I think, so he was curious about the target ratios. Um, what are the target ratios, assuming that they should be in line with what he calculated, but what are your target ratios for those same? We don't, that you have, put up there? We don't have target ratios, but seeing this, mm -hmm. I think makes us need to look at um, and question um, and work on that plan. And I think. Um, a goal uh, to get to needs to be a part of that. Okay. And then um, he wanted, he asked, and, and maybe you saw this, I'm not sure what he said in the message he wrote to you because I wasn't on it. He wrote it to Josh, but Josh forwarded it to me. So, I okay. Guess. So, uh, the timeline for the targets and how they, we decided for, you know, similar districts, state standards. However, we decided that. And then the process in place to ensure students are getting the proper care, not just the fastest solution or the one that sounds the best on, on the surface, right? Um, so those are kind of his things. Um, and I don't know if that was in the note you got, but if it wasn't, I'd be happy to forward this to you or if you just wrote down, if you took these notes today. So those were Director Ledoux's questions about the data that was um, in the packet. And then um, my questions are similar. They're, they're, I, I guess I thought that what you were presenting today was a little bit different. So maybe we should take this offline, but just for the record, I'll ask the questions, but I don't expect that you brought the answers with you tonight. So um, let's see. So what we talked about last time is that there was a 20 FTE increase in the paras. And um, we were going to seek to understand that. We talked about possibly just understanding the categories that they're in because it very well could be that that number is the justified acceptable number for our district and it's, it is as it should be. But all we saw was one number in a box and just want to seek to understand what that means. Is that because there's one-on-ones, is how many are one-on-ones, how many are behavior, classroom. I don't even know how you would break that out. So I'm kind of leaning on you to help me understand what the one number in a box really, really means. So, um, um, <clears throat> so I can dig into our numbers and um, flesh out which are classroom paras and which are one-on-ones. Would you like me to reach back out to the? No, I am I think it was just more to try and understand our number in our box, right? What are what are we doing here? Like what school, what are they doing? I, I don't know the answer, yeah. right? Um, that by category, by school. Yeah, and then you had showed, it was a table, I have it here, but of course I don't have a way to project it, but you showed a table that had the, grad, the regular four-year graduation rate, if I could say that, higher education, 35-day initial evaluation timeline, and 80 to 100 general education was on the table. And then our Granite Falls numbers, percentages, and then the state numbers. And um, I guess what I was seeking to understand there is uh, we're about, let's see, we're 
how did I write this? I guess I don't even know. Oh, okay. So we're about 10% below the average for gradu graduation rate. But one of them that um, it just stuck with me is we're missing that 35 day initial evaluation by 6.7%. So every one of those misses is a student waiting greater than 35 days for just the initial evaluation. So I'd like to understand um, understand that number or understand what we need to do or what needs to happen to support us getting to the goal, right? Just like I said at the beginning of the meeting, we need to have an honest conversation about this, right? Like what is happening and what needs to happen? I can answer that one. Okay. That was last year and we had all virtual school psychologists and that was, that impacted us greatly. And we have three, three school psychologists, one is part-time and she is virtual, but as of right now, we're on target to have all of our initial evaluations completed within 35 days. Like a hundred percent, you feel like? We're at hundred percent right now. And do, do we only track it once a year? Is that why we didn't realize we were missing it? Or does it get tracked like monthly? Like, how do we know that we're still on track? We haven't had a late, the only late evaluations we have had this year were students that moved into the district with expired paper okay. that we weren't able to get done in order to count on any given month. Um, as of right now, um, yeah, I mean, we're small enough that we can track and we have those conversations. Okay, so you know somehow, you're tracking somehow that we're hitting it. Yeah, it's just, they call okay. just running lists. Okay, and then help me understand, because I heard you say LRE. Tell me what that means. It's restrictive environment. And 80 to 100% gender education, I'm assuming, means that they're not in a self-contained classroom or or something. Help me understand right. what that means. It means that they're spending 80 to 100 percent of their day in the general education setting. Okay, and we're at 51. I guess the numbers changed just a little bit. It was at 51.6 before it's 51.3, whatever. So help me understand, does that mean 51 percent of our special education students are in general education? Less than less than 80 percent. Less than 80 percent of the time. Yeah. So more than half of our students spend not enough time, not 80% of okay. time. Yes. And look, we're not the worst. How do I, how do I know if that, well, how do I, <laughs> but how do I know, how do I say this? How do I know if 51% is the right number? Does it, is that, I mean, it doesn't seem. Can I just ask a question yeah. real quick? Because you, you just completely changed my understanding of that number. So I just want to make sure that I understand it. You just blew my mind. So are we saying that 51% of our students, not of the 420 or the entire student and population of, of Grand Falls School District is in general ed 80 to 100% of the time and the resulting obviously 48.7 is in, um, is less than 80% or are you saying 51% of the 420 are in general education 80 to 100% of the time meaning that 49% or 48 and some change of the 420 is in less than that. So 420. Okay, so 51, I'm just going to repeat it to make sure I understand. I'm going to type this down. <laughs> so 51, 51.3% of 420 students um, are in general education 80 to 100% of the time. So then 48% of the 420 are in general education less than that, somewhere between 79 to less. Okay. Each, each IEP team makes those decisions. Um, and I, I shared in October that this has been a, a pretty big push by the state. I'm not sure if I shared that several years ago, and I don't have the current data, but several years ago, Washington State was 44th out of 50 states um, on this data. I think I did share that four years ago, we were about the same as the state, and the state is now at 60%. So um, they're looking at us to come up with um, ways to improve that, and we would like to, to move forward on that. 
So realistically, what would be a target goal for our district? Well, the state average is 60, so I would say that would be okay, That makes us a C student. <laughs> We just were shooting for a C. No, I, I'm, I really am interested in that because I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna ask maybe two questions more about that 51. So, 40 ish, nine ish percent of the students are not in general education. They're in not general education per the decision of their IEP team. Right, and it might be that they are in general education 79 percent. It might be that they're in general education 39. Do we have anybody that reviews those or do they only get reviewed once a year, once every two years, whatever? How often is that that decision by the team reviewed? Annually. Hmm. Sometimes more, but always. I'll tell you that 49% right. is surprising. That that seems surprising. But I, I surprising it should be lower or higher. I'm just trying well, to figure out if the goal that we've been given from the federal level is eighty to one hundred percent. Feels like that's the goal is eighty to one hundred percent. Am I right? No, what she's the goal from the state is sixty percent of that's your average. sped. That's not the goal. It's the average. Well, the, the feds are saying eighty to one hundred percent. The feds, I don't. I don't actually know what the feds are saying should be our goal, and I can look that up. Um, I'm just curious because it feels like if our students are 49% not in general education, are we hitting our belonging targets? Uh, I'm just, it's still ringing back here, right? 49% aren't hitting their 80 to 100% gen ed. Are we, are we doing a disservice when it comes to belonging? I don't, like I said, I don't expect that you have the answer, but I want to, I mean, I do want an answer, but I don't expect it right the second. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask the questions. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got some. Okay. So just, I, I guess I just want to take a, a a big step back just for a second, just so, so, you know, my questioning of this is really aligned um, to our data focus, and I certainly don't want, I said before, I'll say it again, I'm certainly not hunting to figure out how the way that we squeeze paras out or, or, or anything. My, my goal is, as I said earlier in my comments, to make sure that we've got the right people in the right places. And as far as I'm concerned, we should do that in every area of our organization to make sure that we're serving students as absolutely best as we can. This is just first. Obviously, we have to follow the requirements of an IEP, 100%, I, I say that we probably, we sh that should absolutely be our focus. So not looking to, to cut any positions or anything like that, I guess, but the data, and this is again, the importance of data, and, and um, Dr. Mills is kind of, as you're saying this, it kind of tells an interesting story. Um, and so my questions are just based upon the, the, the differences in the data as, we, as we're comparing to other districts, and I appreciate you providing this. So um, just so that if anyone's following along online, just so that they know what we're talking about, because I don't know if you got any detail, a 10 to 1 SPED, we just talked about that. What is the definition of a 10 to 1 SPED? So that was October 1st. Okay. Um, so that's the date. Um, uh, 10 to 1, so as of 10 to 1, that's our number and that's our percentage. Our teachers, that's specifically SPED teachers, right? And then specifically paras. Does that number include RBTs? Does it include everyone who's considered quote unquote a para? Or I guess how'd you get the, the para columns? Those that are um, uh, paid for through special education. Okay. So are RBTs in that too? Or? A few RBTs, yeah. Okay. And they're in that 50 number, is what I'm saying. Okay. And, and the reason I'm asking that specific question is, as I said last, RBTs. Um, a, uh, a, a response yeah. behavior tech. Behavior technician, sorry, thank you. And then other staff, what, is, what does other staff entail? Those are related service staffs or school psychologists or um, speech language pathologists or speech language pathology assistants or occupational therapists, physical therapists, um, et cetera. Okay. And then 80 to 100%, as you explained before, we don't necessarily need to go into it, is kind of 
the goal to have SPED students, you know, at least 80% in, in a general education environment, right? Right. And I will look to see if we have guidance from the state or the federal government about what our target should be. Okay. And then in, in still, and in, in just taking a step back, um, you, you made a very valid point, and I, I just want to make sure that we, are in response to uh, the SPED percentages and uh, kind of the arbitrary number that the state sets with funding of 13.5%, and the fact that almost every single district here is above that 13.5%, again, for anyone following on video, so essentially what that means is, is that uh, the district either out of general funds, levies, or, or some other ways pays the cost for that additional, in our case, um, was that 8.5%. Um, there are, uh, we can petition to safety net, uh, for safety net funds, additional funds at the end of the year. Um, at least in the time I've been here, we've never gotten what we've asked for. Um, uh, it, it, it's denied or for a number of reasons, or we get some sort of percentage, but essentially uh, the great community that we have here fits the bill for this. Uh, we have to pay up front and hope that we get as much reimbursement as we possibly can. So there's a significant issue there. Um, and I, I have spoken to, uh, I had uh, dinner with our incoming legislative uh, representative, Sam Lowe, um, and this was one of the main topics that I talked to about him was the need to remove this 13.5% cap. Um, and uh, uh, how it was arbitrarily set, how it significantly hurts smaller districts like ourselves. And uh, he seemed amenable to that. Uh, I could also say that uh, WASDA, uh, one of its legislative priorities this year is also uh, to have uh, this arbitrary 13.5% removed. So I'm extremely hopeful, optimistic uh, that something will be done uh, this legislative session on it. And, you know, certainly will um, you know, as much as we can do to continue that drumbeat of, of something needing to be done on this is, is going to help us in the end. So I, I just wanted to make sure I said that. So um, along the same lines as, as uh, Director Veach, I guess I, I have some questions that I don't necessarily expect you to answer tonight, Beth, so don't feel like you have to. I, I, um, but, you know, it is, I guess, striking to me, um, you know, Maybe I shouldn't, but I always compare things to Sultan um, just because they are, you know, very similar to our districts in a lot of ways. And I guess it certainly is striking to me that that we have over, to, you know, relative there, there's, you know, uh, what is it, 80 or so different, uh, 80 or so uh, greater um, increase in 10 in our SPED number, um, but we have twice uh, and that 80% represents, let's say, 60, I'm doing quick math, let's say about 30% more uh, than they have in SPED students, but we have over 100% more of Paris. Um, uh, so I guess that that the percentage of that is striking. Again, if that's IEPs or something like that, it is what it is, but I guess I'm looking for more information on why that is. That's, that's certainly interesting. It seems like an anomaly to me. Um, uh, especially when compare when you look at you know kind of the other data, it kind of tracks. We they have thirteen teachers, we have seventeen point nine, basically eighteen, right? That that kind of tracks along with those percentage differences. Uh, they have nine point seven other staff, we have eleven point seven. Again, that kind of tracks with that thirty percent difference, but to have over a hundred percent more on paras, you know, is an anomaly. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, uh, uh, the other is, um, and, and part of the answer, by the way, uh, we talked about this last time, I had this, I've had this conversation with Marshall, maybe they classify their pairs as different. I know that that's kind of a thing that, you know, para is kind of a wide statement. So, you know, maybe there's something there. And if that's the case, then let's talk about that uh, and, and dive into it a little bit deeper. Um, just to echo Director Beach's point, I, I'd love to hear for us to, you know, have a goal uh, for that 80 to 100 um, percent. But also, I would like for us to have a conversation about how um, what uh, what we're doing. I said this last time we talked about this, what we're doing to um, uh, to catch these students up, if possible, with their uh, with their other aged, school-aged um, uh, students to try to transition them out of SPED um, 
to uh, you know to try to get them to where they need to be, what interventions, you know, what our goal is there for what that looks like, you know, kind of more into, you know, and then even more so, and this was a big part of our conversation with um, the, the professor from Gonzaga, the school psych professor, what are we doing at, from an intervention standpoint early on to uh, with kids that clearly data, I ready data is showing that that is their trajectory, that they are lagging, uh, what interventions that we're doing and what successes and, and do we need to do to specifically um, change the trajectory of them heading into, uh, into SPED. Um, uh, from one of the, the key points that he made that was really shocking to me, um, and I, I hope I don't say it, is that the data shows that really in third and fourth grade, if significant interventions aren't put in place there, uh, then the die has been kind of set, right? That they are, uh, to a certain extent, that that is kind of where they're headed uh, and that we need to do some significant, the data shows that we need to do some significant, specific, targeted, focused interventions uh, in third and fourth grade. Again, you don't necessarily have to answer it now, but I, I don't feel like we're doing that to a large part. I feel like we're looking more towards middle school as doing that, which, you know, based upon what you're saying is, you know, in a lot of cases, I never want to use the term too late, but is later in, in the game uh, than we certainly should. Um, and then I guess I, I also, outside of that holistically, would like to have a conversation about what specifically are we doing, what are the school psychs doing as far as interventions um, with students, you know, uh, holistically, like are we, you know, are we scheduling, you know, in, uh, uh, a focus time specifically on goal-based um, uh, standards? What I mean by that is, hey, you know, the iReady data shows that this student is having a, a trouble in reading, so focused, we're, we're going, we're doing a pullout, we're focusing on, you know, this specific, uh, to get the student to this specific metric, okay, and then we're, we're pulling back out, and that pullout time isn't necessarily interruptive to the, to the larger, to the other areas, so creating holes uh, academically there. So I, 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 the heart, I guess, of what I'm saying is I'd like to get a lot more deeper into this, into the data, into the interventions, into the kind of things that I'm saying there so that we can kind of understand uh, where we're at and where we're going. Like I said, this isn't and it's something I want to do in this area. I'd love to get into the weeds of this uh, in all of our areas. And Dr. M, you can feel free to tell me if you think I'm headed in the wrong direction. Um, but I guess that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, that's uh, your your uh, discussion is really somewhat related to this chart, um, but I think it also goes into a lot of other uh, to our general ed as well, and and I, it, it, what what the professor was saying was basically if you're not doing some interventions, some strong interventions by third fourth grade, they're a struggling reader. In fourth grade, they're going to be a struggling reader through their their school career and into life, and so we really owe it to them. And so that's go back to that early literacy intervention. We should be investing in, and then, as we say, the, the work that we're doing at our early elementary is important. Yeah, and I, I don't want to belabor that point, Dr. M, thank you for saying that, but that was, I think that was the part that, like, literally shook me, is that, you know, for the rest of their academic career, right, the cat, the die is almost cast at that point, right, and, and again, I, I don't know if we're if we're leaning into those to really hard in that third and fourth grade, so we need to pivot, right? Again, spending money in the right place, making sure we have people in the right place. I think we need to pivot more to look more to the to to uh, that grade level to make sure that we're really intentionally doing that. I didn't realize this is my fault. I didn't realize how intricate school psychs are to the um, uh, to really diving into this data. So that was the other piece. Thank you for reminding me is I, I, Beth, I'd, I'd love to learn more is how deeply are our school sites that we now have that aren't tele looking at the iReady data, evaluating the iData, you know, looking at trending metrics, interventions, all of that stuff. Um, so I, I know that's a lot and more than you could talk about in a comeback meeting, but um, just to get it out there, those are the things I'd like to talk about. Yes. Um, I well, I, he kind of asked a question that I had, which was about the other staff. Um, and so that was answered. I kind of have more of a comment, which 
I've said before, and I'll say it again, but we're looking at these charts and we're looking at these numbers and everybody's always concerned about that 50 there where the pairs are and what they're doing. I would like to see your breakdown of where each of the pairs are, but my challenge is to anybody who's looking at this data and so focused on these charts to go to the schools, observe, walk the halls, better yet volunteer, substitute teach, hang out in the resource room, and most importantly, talk to the paras and ask them questions because that is going to give you more insight on why we have 50. Um, <coughs> that's all I have to say. Thank you, that's why a focus group with the staff is one of, is part of the plan. Still. Sorry. I, I, <laughs> I guess just one, just one follow up. Um, Director Kincaid, because I've, yeah. I've heard you say that a couple of times, but I guess the part where I scratch my head is, is, is are, you, are you saying that the kids in Granite Falls are unique in their needs of paras and, and of supports, more unique than any other district that we're looking at? Because that's what I'm talking, I, I would can I Can I be open and candid with you? As, in a public meeting, uh, well, okay. say whatever you want to. As someone who has substituted in but five to six now surrounding districts. Yes, we are unique. So there's something different about the boundaries of Grand Falls School District that's different than any other district. I can't. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just asking yeah. for clarification. From my observation, yes. Do I know what that is? Absolutely not. But yes, we are different. So it's like something in the water. I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know. But we are different. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I've never processed us being different, quote unquote, but uh, um, that's just my my observation from being in classrooms in grades, kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, actually, I, I've been in middle school, also, but that's my observation is we are a bit different. Um, not a bit significantly. Well, yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Hi. <laughs> So now I have two because they were talking, but it's not on this slide. So you'll be happy to know that if you want to go to the end, Mike, you should be quick. I think these are yes, no questions. Um, does faith plan mean independence somehow? Thought I figured that out. So faith is an acronym for something. No, I used fade in the slide, um, but I prefer independence. Oh, okay. Um, because really, um, that's our goal for okay. students. And so as we're fading the para, we would be creating independence. Ah, so. okay, I got you. So then my question I wrote down when you were speaking, because I actually did write this down back then, but um, you said we're creating processes for, oh, staffing request processes. So um, have those been finalized or when will they be finalized? Do we? Well, they're in draft form, but I'm doing the focus groups okay. first to that try was, and inform them. See, now there's that. That's my final question. So you mentioned uh, the words interesting dynamics and possible things that are pointed to in that first focus group. Uh, are there anything that rose right to the top that, like, as the director, you're like, huh? Yes. So can you tell us what some of, like, I mean, what were some of that kind of low-hanging fruits or whatever that you see there? I really want to have that conversation offline. Oh, okay. All right. I, I was hoping, I didn't know what it was. So, okay, that's fair. All right. Really, that really was my question, but I did write those questions down when you were on that slide. Okay. Any other questions? I just saved my comment for last. Um, so I, I, I too have been working in the schools at Director and Cade and I've seen the pairs in action. And I, I just, I wanna make sure this, as we go through this, and I think it's the right thing to do to inspect everything. I mean, it, it's not a wrong process we're going through. I wanna make sure it's very clear that this has no reflection whatsoever on performance or ability. This is all just like, we've gotta be good stewards and look at everything. And I'm, I, I would not be surprised if the answer is 50 is the right number. I'm just saying we've got to look at it to be good stewards. Mm -hmm. So to make sure the message doesn't get out that yeah. there's a witch hunt. No, we're just being good no. stewards. We're doing our job. Um, and and I, I know that's the heart of everyone on this board. I just want to say it out loud so that that's out there. Thank you. Um, so uh, that's it. And and I, I do agree. I mean, maybe we are different. I don't know. But that's, that's why we're doing this process. So I really appreciate that. All right. Thank you. <laughs>
3D business report prepared by Marshall Cruz. <laughs> Almost crashed into that. The grocery store didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just going to point out a couple of slides and, and uh, take questions, but before we, before, I wanted to piggyback on Beth's presentation real quick, just for a second, and the, one of the biggest facts that we can take away, and Carl talked about, all, special ed funding is broken. It is completely broken. We have to scrape, crawl, spend hundreds of hours probably thousands of hours a year to get safety net for those 6% of students that are not funded by the state. And all that work that we do, we get about $900,000 of safety net. If all the state did was remove the cap, we'd get $1.4 million for us doing nothing but servicing the kids. So, and we'd get that as we spent the money. We wouldn't have to wait until August to get August, September to get the money. We get it every month. And it'd be five hundred thousand dollars more than what we have to just crawl, beg, plead, go through committees for, spend hundreds of hours just to get money that we've already spent. So, if we had, if the cap was removed, which I know is something they're talking about, we would have much more resources to support those kids. I mean, the, the conversation whether those kids belong where they belong, but at least don't punish us for having a different ratio of special ed kids in other districts. Anyway, yeah. I just want to say that. But, so a, a, a different ratio you arbitrarily made up. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's not just the different ratio than the norm. It's the number they just made up, right, Carl? Arbitrary completely. Yeah. And if the, if the reason for it is because at some point in the distant past, districts are using that to generate revenue, well, audit the districts better, but don't punish the ones that actually have the need. And that's what I feel like we're being we're being punished because we have the need. We're having to beg for money at the end of the year to pay ourselves back. Um, so this year I added a few slides to the physical presentation. There's a um, a revenue projection. There's a expenditure projection. There's kind of a forward looking slide that talks about some bigger things that are going on in the next 30, 60, 90 days. So I just wanted to bring those couple of slides to your attention. And um, the big thing coming up is that in January, we'll get our uh, enrollment true up where our actual enrollment um, is then generates our real revenue for the year rather than our budgeted revenue. And we'll have a much better idea of how on target we are, but we look on target right now to, to hit our goal. Um, revenues a little higher than what we're expecting expenditures are maybe a little bit lower. We're off this month because we had some front loaded expenditures we had to spend, but I think we're on, we're in a good spot so far. There's a lot of, a lot of pressure for staffing, a lot of pressure for extra hours, a lot of, a lot of pressure for student supports, but um, we're, we're a really hard time hiring staff. So we're having to spend some money on contracted agency staff that we would normally have for our, internal hires, but um, we're doing, we're on target. Board, do you have questions for Marshall? I had a couple of questions. Um, sorry, I didn't send this to you earlier, but I figured you just know the answer, uh, honestly. Uh, so looking at the highlights, transportation vehicle fund balance is high because we didn't purchase a bus. Does not they'll come and take that money? The state, will the state come and take that money back? No, but no. what happens though, if we don't, if we don't, Stay on a regular bus purchasing cycle. Yeah. Our depreciation, the, the, that money comes from the depreciation of our buses. Okay. And once our buses are fully depreciated, and we'll stop getting that revenue. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to, when you have the money, to, to immediately keep spend it on a bus, even if you don't need a bus. I mean, it's a like government system at its best. You know, if you don't need it, you still got to spend it, or else it will go away. Yeah. Um, so we have, we, we really need to be in a good cycle of purchasing buses. Okay. All right. And then Can I tag because just so we don't have to go back. So I guess who, because um, I, I had that question, uh, who, how did we get off? Like, because that, that wasn't us. We didn't decide, the right. board didn't. There's been some turnover in transportation. So it, it's, a, it's been a transportation function and I've started having conversations with them about, let's get a couple of buses purchased this year. 
so that at least get them on the books. So we're going to probably start going out for bid soon. So I'll, I'll probably be reporting back on that frequently this year. Okay. And again, just for anyone listening, just real quick. So um, transportation is a co-op between us and Lake Stevens. And yeah. I forget what percentage of, of that that we... Uh, we pay about 25% of the overhead costs of that cooperative. And then we pay for all of our driver costs, our bus costs, all that stuff. But the, the overhead we pay for about 25% of. So the, the turnover that you're talking about is in the transportation office there that they're you know the right. transportation manager left and the new one yeah. and so in that transition they just i guess just didn't say on the and the and that didn't just say on the site yeah it's been something that just hasn't been a, pri a, a priority on their end either for, for their district either it's just um you know their whole office is out driving routes every almost every day because there's such a shortage of bus drivers um, which i guess uh, I just make one point, and then you can ask questions. Okay. Just as a tag to that, which this is this is me talking uh, as a board member. I feel that you know we need to grow to a place where we can have our own transportation, where we 100% of that is, is solely for us, uh, where we have our own transportation manager and stuff. Obviously, we're not there now, but it, it's kind of things like this where we have limited control, limited visualization, and stuff like that. Just my two cents. So. My next question was. Um, Currently on track, meaning five percent fund balance. How confident are you on that? I just want your gut feeling. Um, I would say I'm in the. If we keep doing our job, seventy-five to eighty percent. And 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 I, I know the answer is yes, but you're looking for any pitfalls that might blow that number up. Yeah. So I'm going to tag off you because apparently you're taking the lead and we're just we're just here for the ride. Hey, when you when you're not the president, you get to go for it. <laughs> No, but I like where you're going with that because um, you started out with my number six and now you've gotten um, up a little bit higher. Or well, no, actually it's number seven on mine. So you made the comment in the report that budget depends on monitoring any added costs like extra time, supplies, and additional staffing. So I know that we got hit kind of hard, not even kind of very hard with timesheets at the end of the year last year for all kinds of additional time for something. I'm not sure what it was. Um, how's that monitoring? <laughs> like, and do we have a method to make sure we don't get slammed with extra timesheets that we do have coming? Yeah, we, we just got all of our November timesheets. So I will be doing a summary of what the November timesheets look like. Okay. And then, um, Coming back to why finding out why there's extra right. if it's being paid for by a grant that's fine if a school decides that they want to use part of their building budget to pay for some extra staffing needs that, that's that's fine that's why they have a building budget mm -hmm. but if it's staffing that is above and beyond what was in the budget or what an IEP calls for or <laughs> is anything like that then we need to really understand why mm -hmm. and you know we talk about any kind of staffing needs that come up we talk about as a group in cabinet even the smallest a two-hour student supervisor we'll talk about that in cabinet as a group and you know keep in mind the entire district when we're making these decisions yeah. and then um so i wanted to say thank you so much for the 306090 look ahead i truly appreciate that i don't know if it I'm I'm assuming you have some sort of chart as far as expenses 30, 60, 90 ahead. And if maybe you could include that for us as we're looking at trying to get to this 5%. I don't know if that's something you have, but there's some version of that. So one thing that we do is when we know that an expense is funded, we try and get it into a PO so that it's encumbered in our in our in our finances. So what in in the in the expenditure per chart that I have in there, there's a column with encumbrances. Right, yeah. Those are upcoming expenses that we know we are gonna have that we've identified and we've we've okay. put them into the system so that they show up on our reports. Gotcha. So the time sheeting situation is different because it's not encumbered, right. it just comes in sideways. At right. The end. Gotcha. I didn't mean to hijack that's, I mean, Honestly, that, that's the biggest no last question. You're fine. That's the biggest monthly mystery is where, where that's going. So we're that's that's our number one goal is to get a 
really good process in place for tracking that and understanding what impact it's going to have. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. I don't think I had any other. I've got one if you're still no, going to play. On the revenue forecast for December, the safety net, the $1 million, I thought the number was different than that. What we're getting from safety net, is it $1 million? I just throw in a million. So we get, we get, last year we got about $900,000 in safety net. We got about $230,000 in what they call community impact. Um, so since we don't really know much yet, I a million dollars is a re reasonable estimate. How much did we submit for? Last year. Well, so I guess that's why I'm, I'm that's where I'm scratching my head. So this is December revenue forecast, and in there you have a safety net a million dollars. This is for our this is our end of year revenue forecast. This is what this is as of December's information. This is what we forecast our end of year revenue will be. Right. So end of December. End of end of school year. End so of. I, so we're gonna. I think it has thirty seven totals to like thirty seven point. Okay, so this is not end of December, right? Because it, okay, the title December twenty two fiscal report is just the title right. of the presentation. Yeah. This is end of year, right? This revenue forecast. Yeah. Okay, okay, I, I get what you're saying now. Great right. minds think alike. I was wondering <laughs> the same thing. All right, at least I need to change the title on that That's, line. That's no, no, no. <laughs> That's okay. Two great minds misfit. All right. Here's my, yeah, all right, last question. I know I have asked you this question before. I'm going to preface this by saying one of my favorite Reddits is called explain it like I'm five, <laughs> right? So explain it like I'm five. Help me understand. We got the accounts payable for September on the December 7th board report. Is that the thing that I was looking at? The attachment I is September. I would have done... It said for the month of September. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong. Let's say that one more time. I think I November are in this corner again. What am I looking at? I've opened it 19 times. I didn't look, and I... <laughs> seriously, I've got it open like everywhere. It says that's October. It says for the month of September 2022. So I'm just curious. What do you? I don't. It's October. It says. It was attached okay. just for the month of September oh. 2022. I see what you're seeing. Yeah, so we have oh, September. Yeah. And we should, I, have so September. we should have at least October and probably November. So yeah, I don't see November. So I was like, it's been 68 days That's since November. the end of September. <laughs> it says at the top that it's 1129, but then yeah. on the thing it says September. Oh, it's, it's for the, what's wrong, I guess. Uh oh, is that in your packet? Is that in look. his report or is that in the it's, it's on the agenda? It's attached to the agenda. Yeah, no, what up here is October. Yeah. There's an October one and there's a September one. The 1129. Yeah, so yeah, October is a top. Oh, is it? That's just really so so right. November report was finalized when we had to submit it because we submitted it last Friday. Okay. So well, you I don't know. Can I think there'll there'll be a nice there's an agenda item to change the meeting structure. Mm -hmm. Second Wednesday, we'll let data be more. We have the meeting second, fourth Wednesday. We'll let let the data be more noted for future yeah, discussion. <laughs> All, right. All right. So it was just maybe an erroneous attachment. It wasn't that it takes sixty eight days to attach it. No. Okay, well, I mean, gotcha. November might not. I mean, it, for a first uh, first week of December, right? November might not be there on normal first week of okay. December. But October should be there. Okay. Gotcha. So, so just for clarity, um, good cut. So is that is the September really November or it is September? It, it is September. It's September and October. Okay. And October and we're not November. No. Okay. No. We. I mean. But if we. Am saying if we move it to second and fourth, maybe? Okay. Yeah. I got. I got that piece. I guess I just that wanted to make sure. It's reasonable for us not to have the prior months in there, if we're going to do it on the first Wednesday of the month. Okay. I just, you know, okay. It's like, I, it's like I probably can't, I can't, I can't. If it were December 14th, I can probably report out on November's financial data. Okay. Sounds like a plan. I will, I will take your suggestion for future <laughs> discussion. All right. Any other questions? Any questions? All right.
Thanks, Marshall. And if you haven't checked out, explain it like I'm five. It's really fun for nerds <laughs> like me. Anyway, um, where did I put my agenda? Yeah. All right. And now we are at executive summary of school improvement plans <laughs> presented by Karen. Can I, can I start off yes. just with a comment? Um, I should have sent this to you earlier. I've been a little with, you know, now I say I've been, I should have sent it earlier, but um, I, I figure I'd tell you this now instead of the end. One thing I would love to see with these, maybe send it as an attachment later, is the why. Because you have here, we're going to talk about what to improve, how much, when, for whom, and what, you know. But the why we chose those numbers, like why did we choose the number we wanted to improve by? Why, why that percentage? Why not more? Why not less? I just, something I'm going to, I figure I'd just let you know about that. I don't want to seem like, it's an attack at the end of the, uh, at the presentation. Just I'm going to want to, I'd love to know why. That's great. So. And, and thank you for the suggestion. It's actually, I'm going to share it with OSPI. Mm -hmm. The principles follow the template from the state and it doesn't ask for the why, yeah. but we will do that. And I think that's a great suggestion to share at the state level. Yeah, I mean, because we're going to improve by 12%. Why 12? Why not 13? I mean, yeah. So. And what about a how? That's all I know. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. anyway, anyway, sorry. Yeah, I just want to give you a forewarning. That was going to be my question. All right. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Well, good evening. Uh, this presentation focuses on the context for the small improvement goals that our principals and assistant principals have developed. And again, I want to say thank you to them for being here this evening, in addition to the hard work that they're doing in their buildings and with planning. The executive summary document in the board packet provides a compilation of the improvement plan goals for each of the schools. And then the school's plans include their action steps, monitoring of progress, adjustments, and ongoing results of the improvements. And in addition to the goals that you see here this evening, and the principals will share those plans with you when they present to the school board in the upcoming board meetings. I'm going to start with um, just very briefly the federal and state context. And, you know, as you know, each school in Washington state is required to submit to the school board a plan of improvement, and that happens annually. And our state obviously is a local controlled state, but even so, the requirements for improvement come from the federal level, and then our state law and the offices provide the directives and guidance. And I was, you know, we were thinking about since a time when most of us were in schools, um, since then accountability has just become um, much more prominent, has greatly increased, and truly we're thankful for our board's commitment to this important work. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna leave this up just for a moment because I'll talk about the template, um, but moving to the local context, in our district, our principals and assistant principals lead the improvement process for their schools, and they do that together, the two leaders of the schools. They engage their leadership teams and the staffs in the work of developing their plans, putting their plans into action, monitoring their progress, adjusting as needed to ensure anticipated movement toward attainment of goals and evaluation. And then, of course, there are other stakeholders involved, the entire staff, like families, and so forth. And we do use the optional template provided by the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, OSPI. And that is the plan, that complete plan that the school administrators will submit to you for the review prior to the board meeting scheduled for their school plan discussion. And then in looking specifically at goals, OSPI uh, directs schools to identify SMARTY goals. And um, the acronym for SMARTY is here, and um, I'll just read it out loud. It's specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound, inclusive, and equitable. And here we get to Director Butler's uh, comment, which I think is great. Um, OSPI asks us to include the answers to these questions within the SMARTY goal. And it makes sense to add something that talks about the why behind the development of the goal. And then in addition to the SMARTY goals, our principals have added another to their school improvement plans this year. And as you know, some time ago, the school board provided direction um, for the development of goals to ensure that all of our schools would reach the smarter balance state averages in 
reading and math, English language arts and math by the end of the 23-24 school year. And then Dr. Middleton uh, directed our administrative teams at the schools to create a goal, and he also provided a template so that would be a support as they were developing the goals. So um, as you look through, you'll see that even our primary school, which doesn't administer the Smarter Balance Assessment, included a goal that helps our second graders to prepare for their eventual participation in the test the following year. And this slide is one of the most critical aspects of school improvement. It's the Plan, Do, Study, Act, cycle of continuous improvement. And as Dr. Middleton and I were talking through this uh, presentation, what I would be sharing with you, we acknowledge that many of you, well, all of you have experiences, rich experiences outside of um, what you do here as leaders. Uh, many of you in the business world um, using continuous improvement processes and then other fields also use a cycle of continuous improvement to guide work for better outcomes. And for instance, in medicine, new therapies and medicines are developed, move through a cycle or cycles of testing, adjustments are made, and just to ensure that when finally something is um, provided to be used, that doctors and patients um, are successful with the results. And education is similar. And then when we work through the cycle, uh, many variables need to be considered. And when we look at this graphic, I'm going to take just a moment to talk about each part because they're all important, but they're, it's critical that each piece is done well in order for improvement to be successful. So the first piece is the principals and assistant principals developing their goals. And that goes back to the why, using the data that they have available, using processes that are recommended, using research-based practices to create their goals, and then they plan their action steps. What is it that they're going to be doing to improve and move the schools toward the plans, toward the goals? And then it seems obvious, but the do is up there for a reason. It's a critical phase. In schools, uh, so much happens every day. And it's so important that principals and system principals are staying on top of implementing the plans that were made and monitoring for implementation because there will be various people at the schools who are working on the parts and then ensuring that that is being done and there's data. Are we implementing, as we said, um, in alignment with our plans? And then the next phase is study. And that's where really the data is um, analyzed deeply. Um, teams are looking at, did we achieve our intended results? And the principals right now are leading teams in doing weekly work, teacher teams through the professional learning communities, and then in their staff meetings. So it's an ongoing process. But what they're looking at is, are we implementing? Are we attaining the goals that we had intended to attain? Are we making progress? We don't want to wait till the end of the year. How are we doing that on a regular cycle basis? And then in the act phase, that's where the analysis, of, excuse me, the analysis of the data determines whether um, maybe a change that was well vetted and worked well enough places needs to be abandoned. Are there adjustments that need to be made? Or well, we've seen um, examples of highly successful changes. And that's where the principals and their teams are saying, this really worked. We're going to continue with this. We, um, also just want to emphasize that it is really important throughout the whole process to have a laser focus on the goals, processes, and systems that we need to be affected improvement. And then um, just sharing briefly the support for the principals as they do this work. Um, I know this question or comment had come up previously, and we thought it might be helpful just to share a little bit of background. Uh, Dr. Middleton and I work with a highly skilled consultant who is, um, has been proven to be effective in school improvement work, and um, we provide a monthly three-hour professional learning team session, and the directors um, in academic areas, principals and assistant principals attend. And then Dr. Middleton and I meet monthly with the individual teams, principals and assistant principals, to discuss improvement toward the shared purpose of the success. And then um, 
Principals also receive guidance and supports through OSPI and our regional educational service districts. And then they can work with improvement coaches. They could be in webinars that are offered and they get access to research-based tools. And then we did write a grant. Um, and we've been doing this on a regular basis to provide access for resources so that we have um, additional coaching time for the principals that is directly related to their And then our next steps, um, we're looking ahead to each of the schools presenting their school improvement plans, um, discussing in detail the goals, how those were developed by the teams at their schools, and um, why those are important. And then we have talked about last year, um, we used a tighter version and talking about making that even um, uh, just, just providing the structure so that our school board is able to get the information that they would like. Um, they will talk about the action steps that they set. They'll be able to share with you how the monitoring progress is going and what they've already adjusted, what they found has worked well, what they're updating, and then um, where their progress is in relation to the intended goals at the end of the year. And so we'll be meeting at the schools to do that work. And so in closing, just really want to, again, thank you for your commitment and your support of this work that's at the heart of what we do in our schools. It's about each student achieving to the highest levels, to their potential, but achieving benchmark and beyond so that they can be successful. So thank you. Questions for Dr. Mans? I guess I can jump in. So one of the challenges of, of this, and this isn't a new feeling, I guess I've, I've always had this feeling is when we talk about these goals, there's no lens in looking where our existing goals are, right? The 21, 22, how are we performing towards those goals? What was working, what, what isn't? And, you know, and then using that to then inform, of, okay, well, you know, this is where we're going, you know, based upon that. And, you know, and this is an improvement or this is a, from our previous goal, we're only looking kind of in the place of time, not looking back and going, okay, what have we done? What was our goal for this year? How are we performing towards that? Those types of things. So I actually pulled up our goals for 21, 22 and I'm confused. Well, not confused. That's the wrong word. I guess I, I just want to dive in deeper into the data of it. So our SMARTY goal for Mountain Way, and I'm, I'm just using Mountain Way because it was the first one that came up, was just in reading, um, was to increase uh, from a 14% uh, to a 22% um, based upon uh, iReady in October of 21, uh, and uh, 22 based on the May of 22 diagnostic. And so it, from, um, and then also, hold on, I should have clicked off that page. I have tons of, of tabs open, uh, was to increase low-income students from 11 to 22%. So then when I look at um, our goal for 22-23 uh, goal, uh, it's to go from 12 um to 30 percent so obviously we're starting lower uh, than we previously were um and growing to 30 percent uh and then uh for multilingual students from zero to 20 percent but the low income student goal is gone uh there's no discussion of how we performed to that goal we, we were going to, we previously said 11 to 22 percent you know, you know, hey, we were successful there. We can move on to something else. It appears that we're 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 kind of we're moving on from that and now going multilingual, which is important. I guess I'm not belaboring that, but I, I guess I would contend if we aren't hitting our goal for low income, maybe we are, maybe we aren't. Why are we taking our eye off of that ball and now focusing on multilingual? And then specifically, again, looking at data, what do we? Are we forecasting to hit our 22% goal? Sorry, that's my alarm to tell me to stop eating. Um, uh, uh, and that's why it's, it's, you to stop eating. It, that's why he sounds angry because I, I don't want to stop eating. Um, uh, and so what are we doing different? If we aren't good forecasting to meet our goal, what are we going to do different this time? And I know maybe we'll get into the, we'll probably get into those weeds as we're as we're talking individually. 
Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll stop there and let you give some feedback before I, I, I give more. Well, and I think, and, and I know you're ready to jump in. I'm just going to say an overall statement. Um, I, I think what you said is wise, and, and Dr. Middleton and I are always trying to balance, you know, not putting like a lot of, we don't want to be cluttered when, when we just provide. Um, but I think it makes sense to go ahead and have the previous year goals and what comes to you when we present the school improvement plan, even if the state is just requiring the one year at a time, that would be an easy piece to add. And then just to add a bridge conversation from each school to explain why this score is shifted. And I know I can see this is why I'm principal ready to um, write questions and the things that I think about often at night as I'm going to sleep. So as you are aware from the goal, our scores dropped, right, from I ready. So from our fall to spring, they went up. And then when we tested again this next fall, they went back down. And so I started the goal where they were in November. And then I was like, oh my gosh, you know, we need to at least make the 22%, but we're not getting anywhere if we don't extend it to at least 30%. It's really super low still because that's only 30% of our kids at benchmark. But if we're starting at 12% at benchmark right now. If we get to 30%, then that is a push that we're going to really try. The um, free and reduced or the, the poverty, the uh, low income is really hard to track and I ready. And so that's why then we kind of switched that goal and went to multilingual learner. And we feel like any supports that we're giving right now to our multilingual learner will help all of our students, especially our students at poverty as well. Okay. So those strategies are good for students that, that need that support. Got it. And and not to pick on, on you guys, you're, you're, you're the first one, right? So you're the first one that I can compare. And I know we can get really deep, deep, deep into this when when we're, we're talking about this, um, uh, when we're reviewing each individual one. Um, but I guess just just throwing it out there. So, um, you know, if we can have a discussion based on when that time comes, based upon you know specifically how we're performing to the previous to the existing goal, I guess I would say, and then specifically what we're going to do differently if we aren't doing it, and then also a discussion of if the number that we have is realistic, right? Because and we, we've had this conversation before, and I'll just say it for for because maybe you're having you know I, I live in a in a in a obviously I, I work in the private industry, um, in a in a sales base right. A goal is an expectation, right? If I don't hit a goal, I, every there's a joke in my thing. You can miss your goals once, but if you miss it twice, bye, right? So a goal is you, is, is an expectation. If you don't hit this goal twice, you will lose your job, right? And I know that we're in a different world. We aren't selling widgets, all of those things. But I think that we, with the same veracity, we should we should focus on our goals. Of this is an absolute. You move everything out of the way. Let's talk about deeply it as a director of each's initial of, of, of roadblocks. We can move out of the way because we gotta 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 hit that goal. Um, and if we don't, well, then we need to have an honest discussion of what happened, what are we going to do different, you know, do we have the right people in the, in the right places, are we spending money in the right places, those types of things, because I think that has to go along with that stuff. So, you know, if we, uh, if, if the if the 30% is, is, is a number you think is realistic, that was great, but you can already guess what my next question is. Well, you thought the 22% was realistic, why didn't you hit that? Um, actually, we did at the spring. Okay. We met our goals last spring. And by the way, that was rhetorical. I didn't expect you to answer right now. <laughs> no, that was rhetorical. We did meet it. Yes. But then when they tested again in October, because we used the new scores from October, not the spring scores. Right. Then they went way down. Right. Again. So then we started where they were from October and built a new goal. If we didn't look at October and we wrote the goal in September, we would have used that 22% as our starting right? and then built that up. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't expect you to, but thank you for giving, Sorry. giving, no, no, no. I, I appreciate your, your passion. And I, I, I actually, I really, really do. So um, like I said, this is just kind of a, a preview of, of, of really how deep in the weeds I'd like to go once we individually kind of talk about that stuff. So thank you. 
other questions? I asked them at the beginning. <laughs> All right. I think I appreciate what you brought to us today. And I, I think the, the how and the why are important questions, right? Um, and I think Carl actually um, brought up the point that I was, which was I don't remember us seeing both how we performed last year with our goals. So I think like connecting those, so I get that the state only wants a moment in time, but I think we need to see a path, whatever that path looks like, and, and I don't need reasons for the past, right? Just what are we going to do forward to, to try something else? I mean, we don't know if we're going to be perfect, but, but we know we're going to try something else and we're going to move in that direction and, and tell me why we're moving in that direction. Because honestly, I, I rely on the trained professionals to help me out with that. So thank you. Um, Chair, can we go back to the continuous improvement slide? Because I, I can't emphasize enough that second one of do. We can plan all day long. We can have all these beautiful plans. But if we're not willing to do something and do something differently, we're going to get the same results. And so it's really a different way of saying what was on, on my little graph of we don't want to be that black line. Right. We want to be the one that, that does something and look at those results. And based on those results, if we need to throw something out, we'll throw something out and do something different and we'll act. But we, we got to get out of the plan quadrant and, and really get to do something and do something differently. And I echo that. I've seen, you know, we, Dr. Middleton and I talk and I appreciate, and I'm sure that he's had this conversation with most other people in the room, but I appreciate that he has a strong goal a strong vision of, of where we're going academically and how important that is. And whatever needs to happen, whatever we need to do to get that into the classrooms to the students and not just us in this room talking about it, but the doing part of it, like showing up in the classroom and getting it done, whatever has to happen. And I said it at the beginning as part of what we learned at WASDA, right? It's very important to have the right people in the right positions to get this, get to do the work, right? So I look forward to the reports that we would get, you know, with, with the data, with that on the how and the why. So thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. All right. Seriously, I've got to remember. All right, we really just board reports, board reports, three F. Is there a chance to dismiss principals if they? Ah, uh, yes, we can dismiss the principals if you'd like to go. We've been here a while, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for being here. Do you want to give like a when you start? I'm in 10 minutes, if, yeah. depending upon your board reports. Is this going? Yeah. Um, okay. She's, so, her mom likes her to be done by 8 o'clock if she can. So, I that. Okay. All right, so back to board reports. Sorry, you know, it's funny. I always forgot to do that. Carl had to remind me every time. Let the principals go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I thought about it, but I, was, I didn't think we'd be long on this one. But anyway, um, we don't have WIAA, so we'll go to community report. Okay, um, lots is going on right now, which is kind of cool to see community kind of getting back to normal and doing normal stuff. So, um, I got to uh, uh, go to the chamber meeting um, on the first. Uh, well, I was there, we was there, but um, they are back up and running. And um, they were kind of discussing whether or not they wanted to dissolve the chamber and just be um, committees or if they wanted to keep the chamber. They're keeping the chamber and they've voted in, um, President, Vice President, Secretary, and Treasurer is what they were up to. Um, they are just asking anybody and everybody to come to the meetings and for anybody in the community who has a business um, 
they come and join. I think right now it doesn't cost anything. They waived the fee until January or something like that. Um, so they just kind of want everybody to be involved and participate. And the next meeting for that is um, Thursday, January 12th at 6 p.m. and they're held in um, City Hall. Um, and then I also got to go check out um, the high school performance of Charlie Brown and it was wonderful. They did a great job um, and um, so it was really great to see that and I hope to see more performances from from them because they were really good. Um, you guys kind of covered the food drive. Um, Monte Cristo has a family game night uh, coming up on Friday. And there's like bingo and concessions and it's going to be a lot of fun. So everybody's invited to come. Um, I believe it's five dollars. And then Mountain Way um, is having a holiday bazaar on Saturday um, and Santa's going to be there with pictures and all that kind of stuff. So um, and there's tons of other things going on, but that's just kind of the ones I want to highlight. So. <laughs> Thank you. Legislative proposal. I have a question. I, yeah. I, I might have missed it. What days are deliveries for the food drive? Do we know? 14th and 15th. Yeah. 14th and 15th. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, a couple of uh, big things. So I, I kind of briefly talked about my meeting um, with uh, what is shortly to be Representative Lowe, um, who did win um, his election in the 39th. Um, he was nice enough to, to come up and meet. Um, we had a, a wonderful discussion about um, regionalization and uh, SPED funding, and uh, I, I thought it was, it was really good, um, as well as um, a kind of a discussion about inviting um, our, all of our um, legislators in the 39th uh, to uh, come in uh, before the session starts to come and actually you know, participate. Uh, Dr. M and I have talked, and um, we're going to try to get them actually for the 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 food um, the, the food handout. So um, I, I we just got that tonight. So I'll reach out to them and see if that's something that I can get set up. Um, I'd love to also, um, if we can, you know, have them actually see our buildings and 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 you know, teach in the classrooms and and kind of you know um, uh, our steam building at the middle school. It's a lot to pack into a day. So you and I can can talk more about you know what that looks like and stuff like that. Um, so um, I guess more to come on that. Uh, one of the things that I, I sent um, to um, uh, Dr. M and Atina, so because I am uh, I am the WASDA legislative rep for District 1, I'm also technically a member of, of the uh, Federal Relations Network, which is basically the, the, uh, uh, the federal school boards uh, across the country. And uh, they have a, uh, a day on the hill um, where, uh, or kind of a day on the hill where they go to Capitol Hill um, and they speak to our federal um, representatives about um, uh, specific items this year's IDEA, special education funding. Uh, there's actually a mandate. Um, uh, the, the federal government has never stood up to the requirements of, the, uh, of funding for special education, uh, free meals, and safe and healthy school buildings and fundings. Um, uh, so... Normally, I would just see that email and I would delete it as I have every single year. And so there was this year, uh, I thought, huh, okay, well, those are important things. I want to try to keep the heat up with special education as much as possible, as well as universal free meals. So I'm, I'm twisting it. Certainly, I don't have necessarily the time to spend, but in my, in my drive to be more like Director Butler, I was like, hmm, should I go to this? So that's not something I'm necessarily asking right now. We can talk individually. This is really the only place I can say in a public meeting. So I can talk to everybody all at once. So I guess I'm contemplating that there is a cost to that. I don't necessarily know if I'd want the district to pay for it, or if I pay for it out of my own pocket. I mean, they're, they're, if we feel like it's important, again, we can have more conversations about that later, but I guess just throwing that out there that, you know, uh, maybe if there was ever a year to go, maybe this is the year to go to really try to lean in as much all in to this type of stuff um, as possible. So um, just throwing that out there. Uh, the other thing just to, to 
to put the board on the on the same page. One of my um, I've got a lot of passion, so I probably should stop using the word passions. But one of the things that at some point I'm going to, on behalf of, of the legislative, I'm, I, I'm going to come before our board chair who sets the agenda and ask for it to be on the agenda um, is a, a resolution um, of a change to the bylaws of WASDA, which has to come from our board legislatively, by the way, has to come from our board and four other boards to be able to be voted on at General Assembly next year. Uh, and that is a, a change to remove weighted vote from uh, voting on General Assembly. Uh, I'm glad to see you guys nodding your head. So for anyone that voted. <laughs> so for anyone that doesn't know, um, uh, WASDA's positions, legislatively, its positions as far as the way that it operates, what it passions is, is set by us, board directors. Uh, we at General Assembly vote on positions and, and, and all of those types of things. Um, so in the beginning, it's a one-to-one -one vote. Every district gets one vote. Uh, if, there's, if there's three districts, I believe, uh, that don't like the outcome of that vote, they can call for what's called a weighted vote. And that weighted vote uh, allows additional votes based upon the size of the district. So if you think just numbers wise, right, not every school district goes to was goes to General Assembly, right? So if you have a um, you know, a city, a, a Seattle school district, a Lake Washington school district, a Bellevue school district. If you have like four of the biggies, four or five of the biggies, they literally have the power to do whatever they want to from a vote standpoint. If, if, if they're aligned, um, that to me is not democracy. <laughs> and that is not the intentions of WASDA to let, you know, what is the big kids in the room tell the little kids in the room what, what's good for them. Um, and, uh, but in order to do that, I have to have five boards, make formal board action. Uh, then I have to submit that to um, uh, Tim Garshaw, who is the uh, superintendent for or the, the, the WASDA. And then at General Assembly, we vote on it. The nice thing about voting on a vote to remove weighted vote is you don't get a weighted vote. About that. <laughs> you don't get a weighted vote to do that. Yeah, just about that. It's a one-to-one -one vote. And so, you know, because one of the things I've heard from a lot of, even here in District Area 1, a lot of small school districts is, oh, WASDA doesn't represent the ideals of my community, WASDA, you know, blah, 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 you know, negative about WASDA, which is probably true. But what my comment next is, is that, well, we school boards get to set what WASDA is about. And if you're not what about WASDA is about, then get involved and let's change what WASDA is about, right? And, you know, and, and at the end of that day, it should be one vote, right? That's democracy. So um, at some point I've got, I will do a formal type up, you know, I would love our board to be the first one. And then I'm basically going to walk the format of that to at least the four other school districts, hopefully more that will come alongside of us. That is going to force the issue to the forefront so that we can vote on it uh, and then go forward from there. So just kind of an update on, on where we're going. Um, I'll just pause there. If you have any questions, basically I'll like any questions? I was going to ask if you had already found the four others, but based off of uh, Wasta Conference, I don't think we should have trouble finding those. <laughs> no, <laughs> so I, I don't think all this. We went, to, yeah, Carl and I were in the same small, and that was one of the topics of conversation. So mm -hmm. I don't think that should be a trouble. All right. Moving along, items from the floor. I'm assuming we have nobody signed up for that. That's good. Unfinished business, none new business. Marshall, here it is. Change in regular board meeting days. Um, this is a discussion and- No, next item. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> For discussion, this was something that I actually asked Dr. Middleton to put on the agenda was, the question came up from the community, why are we at the same day and overlapping time as city council? I've had that question. I asked Dr. Middleton because I feel like this has come up a few times, but I couldn't remember why that would be. Uh, he said, boy, I've wondered that same question. <laughs> so here we are to have a discussion about it. I would propose that we would move to second and fourth Wednesday so that we don't overlap with city council. But in the business report, 
Marshall gave us the point that if we moved to the second Wednesday, he that would provide him time to give us the most recent financial information. Can I, can I just ask a quick question? Is anyone here even opposed to that idea? Just a straw poll, just getting no. that for the room. No, I think that's it. There's our discussion. As as a community liaison, I would opposed to it. The yeah. city council meeting. So yeah, well, and I'm supposed to put it out there what it is before we. Move I know. So like, can I actually just just for discussion? I'll just drop it in here. So I've I've asked this question when I was community liaison. Yeah. I asked this question, and and what I was told, different admin, different superintendent at that point was that. Um, the school, the individual schools try really hard to not schedule anything on board meeting days, um, as I, I think it's our policy, in our policy. Yeah. And the policy uh, says Wednesday, not board meeting day. Oh, really? As, mm -hmm. uh, just a, so I remember, because the thought was, we'll change to a Tuesday or a Thursday. We never even thought about changing to, to, to second to fourth. Yeah, well, we never thought about just changing which Wednesday. Just with the repetition of it. So yeah. I was again different superintendent. I was told that it would be extremely cumbersome for the for the schools to change schedules of already like you know we always do this on the second Tuesday or second Wednesday or whatever. And you know I guess shame on me for not digging deeper into it. So I guess I just dropped that out there. Do you feel the same way, Doctor M? Or uh, like like Director Kincaid said, I, I would like to go to the City Council once a month at least, just to see. I, I'd like to be able to report to them some of the things that are going on in the district. So I, I see no problem at all. Okay. And I just want to out there, having been board chair for five of the past, you know, many years, we have talked about it, but no one ever thought about just changing the Wednesday. We talked about changing to a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Monday. We never even thought about just changing which Wednesday of the month. You yeah. just need to move like, oh. into the gavel. Because I, I talked to Josh about this. I'm like, well, we originally we don't want to change which day of the week. He's like, no, we should change the week. I'm like, oh. Uh, well, yeah, why don't we just do that? <laughs> so in that vein, then, if we do that, I imagine you want this to be immediate. What this like to be out for January. We're going to do it in one point Okay, next year. So, um, because we would like to keep Director Butler for an additional week. Can keep me another week. Un unintended uh, extra, yes. <laughs> that. Hmm. Um, uh, so, is there anything, I guess, just following that vein of thinking, is there anything that's a conflict now that, uh, that we won't be able to go to school related? I looked ahead today and I didn't see any big conflicts. I, I don't think it's going to be an issue. So, I was hoping to bring so, up now with the Christmas break and everything, it's sort of the world restarts yeah, in January. Right, right, adjust our calendars. Okay, well, I so like, we're looking oh, at January fourth as our next meeting. Then no, eleventh, eleventh, twenty fifth. Oh, sorry, second and third. Yeah, eleventh yeah, and. Except the calendar, but it just changes. Okay, eleventh and third. All right. Any other discussion? Can then I'll make a motion that we change the regular board meeting days to the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month. I'll second that. The motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There it is. All right. Consent agenda. Any discussion? Yeah, I just updated my calendar. I, I guess I, I just I would like to say that uh, on the, the additions, which I think that we need to have um a motion for the additions it was uh cool to see uh, john brockman um as a new hire for basketball coach at the middle school um and then um i guess i didn't see we had some resignations but i didn't see any letters or or anything for those i don't know if that's if i just missed it or if, I got one today in my box and I haven't completed it. Okay. I can get that to you guys. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I make a motion we accept the consent agenda with the additions. A second. All right. The motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we are now.